So I thought what I'd try to do here is make sure that you know sort of two things when you leave. One, lawyers are your friends. When you're talking about doing the kinds of things that you want to do, lawyers are your friends. You want them early and often involved in your projects. So when you think about tokens, payments, mobility, um, wallets, I know it sounds pretty simple from your standpoint. Lawyers hear nothing but gobbledygook. They have no idea what that means, but there are more laws that apply to that than what I can even tell you. You're probably familiar with GDPR. Anybody familiar with GDPR? Yeah, that, one's, that one got a lot of attention the other day. CCPA, folks here fairly familiar with CCPA getting there. So in addition to data privacy laws, which is becoming, you know, pretty much expected, there are payments laws. So if you are taking money through a wallet and you're taking that into your account and then you're going and paying somebody else, that's called money transmission. Guess what? You've got to be licensed in every state to do that if you want to do it. And there's federal laws around that too. So there's um, laws around tokens. As Chris mentioned, you want to make sure that you're not creating a security because there's all sorts of issues related to that. Taxation. Are we going to tax these transactions? All the, the, the cities, states, everybody you can think of wants to make money and tax these transactions. Export control laws. There are tariffs. There's the things that we like to talk about. Who do you sue when it goes bad? So there's lots of reasons why you want to have lawyers involved kind of early and often and make sure they know what you're talking about. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this. Mike earlier mentioned risk and sort of thinking about the Toyota and the Tesla models of risk. That's what lawyers should be there to help you do. We want to help make sure that you can move as quickly as you want to, but that means we have to help you assess that risk and when is it an okay risk to take and when do you not want to take it. But in order to do that, we have to really understand the technology and what it is you want to do. And so point number two I want you to remember is we have no idea, for the most part, what you're talking about. You talk blockchain, distributed ledger, you talk tokens. Lawyers, because I've been speaking about this for the last two years, their eyes glaze over. They don't know what you're talking about. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that too. Draw pictures if you can. That is the most helpful thing you can do. Okay? So lawyers are your friends and draw pictures. That's your two takeaways from this. Let's see if, if I can actually get this to work. Okay, this is the explanation for distributed ledger that lawyers get. You can see maybe why we're a little confused, right? That doesn't, you probably know what it means. Lawyers still, for the most part, don't understand that. But that's how lawyers describe distributed ledger. Um, computer software that's audible and up-to-date um, and creates a digital record. If we try to get a little more creative, we looked at pictures like that. That still is not going to really help us assess risk. So when I'm talking to lawyers, and I want you to think about this too when you're describing it to lawyers, you're talking about your business model. If you're talking blockchain, you're talking distributed ledger, you're talking software, servers, and databases at a high level from a lawyer standpoint, right? It's obviously more complicated than has some really awesome features. But then you start to break it into something we understand. And when you say, guess what? There's cloud services. Lawyers just now start to really kind of understand cloud services. So when you say blockchain and distributed ledger is a little like cloud services, you're taking information, but instead of giving it to AWS or Azure, we're going to put it in the hands of lots of different people. That's going to make them panic because then you're just told them we're taking data and we're giving it to a lot of people. Oh my goodness, how do we comply with GDPR and CCPA? So walk them through that and then walk them through what you're doing with that data. That will be one of the most helpful things that you can do. Um, but help them understand software servers and databases. The other thing is you start to talk about the benefits of it and helping them understand that, they're also going to be able to identify risk for you and things that are possibly really positive about this business model from a marketing standpoint and also from a contractual standpoint. When you are providing these services to customers, you have to have contracts with those customers for your service. What does that look like? 
So they need to understand what's happening with the data, what's happening with the software, what's happening with the databases. Now in the cloud services context, lawyers start to think, what's the uptime service level? Everybody's pretty familiar with service levels on uptime availability, right? That's not something we really see in blockchain contracts. Most lawyers are not going to understand that. If you tell them you're either buying or providing a service that's hosted by one or multiple third parties, they're going to come at you with those sorts of questions. Well, what's the availability guarantee? Are there service credits if this isn't working? Things that they're used to seeing now in a cloud services context. So be thinking about those and what the answers and the responses are to that. Does there need to be a disaster recovery? Well, no, because the point of a distributed ledger is you don't need maybe DRBCP. Um, open source, is the software application running your blockchain program got a lot of open source? Probably. That also scares lawyers. So you need to walk them through all of those things because from a legal standpoint, they create potential risk. Everybody's completely freaked out now. I have your attention, right? <laughs> okay. It's all very manageable, though. But the most important thing is remember, have your lawyers with you and have them early and often so they know what you're doing and they can help guide you through these things and how to appropriately handle the risk related to that. Um, decentralized, this is the one that you'll probably really need to walk them through to make sure they understand where the data is going, how it's distributed, and what that data is. Because complying with data privacy laws is going to be one of the most important things to worry about. Um, CCPA, the California Consumer Protection Act that's um, going to be going in effect shortly, takes that even a, a broader step than GDPR. GDPR was a pretty watershed moment for all of us. And I've heard CCPA called GDPR light. That's not actually true. It's really very different in a lot of ways more restrictive. So it even covers things like behavioral data. And much of the information that you're talking here about usage of vehicles is behavioral data that can be identified with a driver. That will be personal information for purposes of the CCPA. So when you're thinking personal data and whether it needs to be worried about from a data protection standpoint, I don't want you to any longer think about it as name, address, email, phone number, account information, because it's much broader than that. So again, make sure when you're talking to the lawyers about your product or the products that you're looking to, to obtain from a third party, you know what kind of information is going to be created and shared so they can do an assessment for you if you need to worry about data protection issues. Um, in terms of immutable, this is one lawyers hear all the time, that one of the benefits of blockchain is that it's immutable. And it's great because once you save the information on the blockchain, it can't be changed, and then it's audible. And that's not always entirely true. Some blockchains um, do let you change the information following certain rules. So one of the points we'll talk a little bit later on is you need to understand what distributed ledger is being used and when, if at all, that information can be changed. So that's really important for the lawyers to understand, too. It's not that it is always immutable. So that's a key piece for the, for the lawyers to know and to, to think about from a risk perspective for you. Um, we talked a little bit about the fact that they really need to understand what the data is. And then this is one that I also don't think a lot of lawyers understand here. I'm pretty sure everybody here knows that there are differences in distributed ledger technologies, right, in terms of public, private, and then hybrids. This is really important for the lawyers to understand which distributed ledger or blockchain you're using because they have rules about how you behave if you're using that particular distributed ledger. Those rules mean that if I'm going to use that, I may have to pass those requirements down to my end users. So I can comply with the rules of the distributed ledger and do my part as a member of that and using their software. So most folks here are familiar with acceptable use policies. Everybody here know what an AUP is? Sometimes you click through them or they're at the bottom of a website that says you can't um, scrape our data, you can't do bad things with our servers. 
there's a lot of those sorts of requirements on using some of the distributed ledgers. You're going to want to pass those things down. So make sure you tell them what you're using because that will help them understand and be able to figure out what are the rules to make sure we're complying with it and what rules do we need to pass through. Not necessarily difficult or, or complicated or going to stop you from using your product or stop you from using a particular ledger, but they just need to know so they can make sure that contractually you're complying with what needs to be complied with. Okay, smart contracts. Um, show of hands, is this a legally enforceable contract, just like when you buy a house? Who thinks yes? Who thinks no? Who is ready to go because it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon? Um, maybe yes, maybe no. So this is really important because a lot of lawyers don't necessarily understand it yet. It's still, they're only starting to understand blockchain. They're not really wrapping their heads mostly around smart contracts yet. Smart contracts, of course, you know, is code. It's if-then statements that are written into code. You might be able to find some really short um, contracts that could be complete, legally enforceable binding contracts that you can put entirely in code. But in order to have a contract under law that if somebody breaches it, if they don't do what they're supposed to do, you can sue, which is, of course, what, what lawyers care about. How do we hold them responsible for not doing what they were supposed to do? You have to still meet all of the legal requirements for a contract. And I tell you, that goes way back to like my first year in law school a very long time ago. And it has not changed, and it's not likely going to change. You have to have an offer, you have to accept it, and you have to have consideration. You have to have some other things. You really can't be under 18. You have to have intent to enter into a contract. Things that when you're automating actions, you may or may not have anymore. So if you're automatically engaging in transactions, is there an intent? There might have been when you started that transaction. Do you can have an intent every single time it happens? Courts have, they're not even thinking about those sorts of things yet. So maybe your first contract, when it automatically executes as a contract, a legally enforceable contract, the ones after that may not be. And if they're changing over time, then you have to have that intent every single time. So for a smart contract to be a legally enforceable contract, just like when you buy a car, you buy your house, there's a lot that it needs to overcome. Good chance it probably won't be. Has anybody here seen contracts with indemnification clauses, insurance clauses, confidentiality provisions, all that kind of stuff, right? Okay, can anybody in here put that into code for me? I would love to see an indemnification clause and an if-then statement that's written into code. Or lawyers really love commercially reasonable efforts, right? We're going to use our commercially reasonable efforts to go off and create this new product. You can't code that. So there's a lot of really complicated contracts that you're going to want to sign or enter into related to your business that are just, they're not going to be smart contracts. But you can still wrap regular contracts, written contracts, or even electronically executed contracts around those smart contracts. So talk to your lawyers and make sure they understand if you're going to have a smart contract as part of, part of your product offering, then your terms of use for your website or your mobile app need to reference that smart contract code. You can incorporate it by reference and do some things like that. So there are ways to make sure you cover it. You just need to let your lawyer know. Again, they're your friends. They want to help you get through contracts and do it the right way. And if somebody does the wrong thing, you can go after them. That's the American way. Um, um, some of the things that we care about, governing law, if you don't do what you're supposed to do, where do you sue and whose law do you apply? So when you have smart contracts, it makes those sorts of things a little more challenging as well. Uh, there may be some additional liabilities. We love that. Um, how do you cap your liability? Really important if you're launching a product in the marketplace, particularly having anything to do with vehicles and payments, you're going to want to have a cap on your exposed liability. You want to make sure that the contract you're using is enforceable. Um, okay, there are lots of different laws already out there. We're starting to see more. The law is really slow to catch up on most of these things. 
They're trying in some areas. We already have the ability to have DocuSign and sign contracts electronically. There's a lot of laws that already exist, but there's new ones on top of it now. So we have laws on top of laws that are sometimes inconsistent. So it's also just good to make sure that you're talking about where your current plans are. You're gonna start in California, you're gonna grow from there. So you can really think about from a risk perspective, which jurisdictions are the best to start in, which have the best current laws that are most clear and easy to understand. And that, that varies by jurisdiction and you can talk to your lawyers about that too. Uh, data privacy, we talked a little bit about already. Um, governance and the consortium models. This really um, relates to using the type of distributed ledger technology. Um, I'll show you the, the next slide. One of the things that we, of course, really care about is what happens if there's an issue with one of these consortiums? Who's responsible? There's no contractual privity with most of these among the members by design usually, and that may be an okay thing, but what if the standards you come up with end up not being good standards and they cause some kind of problem? You put a product in the marketplace that has an issue. Who's ultimately responsible for that? Probably really nobody the way most of the consortiums work. If somebody's contributing data, if, if lots of consortium members are contributing data, what if somebody contributes data that's either bad or that they don't have the rights for? and then other members of the consortium are sued as a result of that. How do you hold other members of the consortium responsible when there's no real contractual relationship among everybody? And those aren't things that you need to answer and there doesn't necessarily need to be contractual relationships among everybody, but there are some things that you and your organizations want to think about. You may or may not want to participate in organizations depending on those sorts of answers. I have some clients that are really large financial services institutions and they don't want any type of relationship among all the consortium members because they think they're the ones that will always end up being sued. So it depends, back up to that risk assessment, if you want to participate in the consortium and if you're okay with taking the risk that you can't sue other people because it's actually maybe a better thing for you. Again, those are just things that you want to think about and know and, and consider based on what the consortium of the organization is doing. You also want to think about antitrust issues as well. So there's a lot of other legal issues around participating in some of these consortiums. Just think about the information you're sharing, who you're sharing it with, and what you should be doing. Not that it's not possible. You just want to be thoughtful and smart about it because there are, there are issues that can come up. I'm going to try to keep this moving here. Um, when you're talking tokens and wallets, um, there are a patchwork of laws across a lot of different countries that are changing constantly. Um, we heard the other day that Bermuda is doing some really interesting things. A lot of states are just, uh, and countries are starting to look at this. So when you're thinking about a token, you really also want to think about what jurisdiction you're going to be in and if it makes sense in that particular jurisdiction and what the current laws are because they are right now all over the place. Um, and some may be more friendly than others. Um, but I wanted you to at least have a sense of, of sort of the, the, the disparity. They go from very lightly regulated to heavily regulated. Um, so just make sure that those are things that you're thinking about, particularly in your product rollout. Um, and then just a couple of others. When you're thinking about tokens, it's not necessarily just whether they're a security that the Securities and Exchange Commission in the U.S. is going to be concerned about. There are other regulators in the U.S., at least, that are very interested in these and may consider them to be a commodity. Um, the CFTC is concerned about that. Um, FinCEN may be interested in it. Um, so there are money servicing I've, I've mentioned up here and mentioned earlier. So it's not just is it a security that passed the Howery test. There may be other regulators even in the U.S. that are interested in what your token is and what it's doing. A couple of others. I, they're all over the place. There's a lot of regulators very involved in, in tokens and what they're doing. Um, yeah, the, CF, the, the CFTC, the SEC are, are probably some of the most active. And then of course the IRS because they don't want to lose tax revenue. Okay, so <laughs> the key takeaways, in addition to the two that I really do want you to have as a takeaway, lawyers really are your friends and we want to help you get through this. 
because this is changing. We don't always know the answers either, but the earlier you involve us in product development and what your business model is going to look like, the earlier we can help you start thinking through these issues and maybe help shape the way you want your particular business model to go and maybe avoid some of these issues that come up down the road. There's nothing worse than having to put a product on hold because something comes up at the last minute that could have been flagged earlier and then make it really easy for us to understand the technology and understand how it's analogous to other things that are already sort of tried and true at this point because from a risk, ass risk assessment standpoint, we can help you assess that risk more quickly. Um, lots of really great uses. Um, there are issues around smart contracts and blockchain, but I, you know, they're all workable as long as you're thinking through them. So it's scarier than it sounds and it's actually not all that bad, but I just wanted to, to make sure everybody's had a chance to understand there are lots of different things to think about, but from a risk standpoint, you can get through them.